Hare Krishna, my dear devotees, welcome back to the daily readings of Śrīla Prabhupāda's books, right here in the Haven, which is located in Hive, Kent, Southeast England, just a stone's throw from the English Channel. We're here today with Abhay Das Brahmachari, my trusty servant and, and companion, assistant, and also my old dear friend, Radharaman, who is also our landlord, Hare Krishna, among other things, the ad hoc VP of the London Temple and other things. We call him the Minister of the Interior because he's an in internal person. <clears throat> Today we're, we're going to enter into the fourth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And I just wanted to talk just a few couple of minutes. How important this is, what we're doing. <clears throat> Actually, the halfway point of the Bhagavatam is somewhere either in the seventh or eighth cantos. And we've reached the fourth canto. And we've just heard the details of the creation and uh, what it means to be a devotee uh, from Kapila Dev and the glories of his eternal associate Devahuti and Kardama, his mother and father, and so many other things that we heard in the third canto. And we are experiencing together exactly what Srila Prabhupada mentioned in his preface that the only thing that is required is to go through the Bhagavatam verse by verse, purport by purport, cover to cover. And this will prepare us for being able to hear Krishna's pastimes in Goloka Vrindavan and Mathura and Dwarka in the 10th canto, which makes up 90 chapters of the 365 chapters of the whole Bhagavatam. So we are doing exactly what Śrīla Prabhupāda asked us to do. And if we continue to do this together, we will all go back to Godhead this lifetime. And we'll be able, we'll be able to relish hearing about Krishna's pastimes with the proper mentality, with the proper um, respect and knowledge of just how wonderful and all-powerful uh, and inconceivable He is. Uh, without becoming overly familiar with his human-like pastimes and get deviated from the two major uh, sidetracks from pure devotional service, that is uh, Mayavad philosophy and Sahajism, which means to take cheaply Krishna's pastimes. So I'd like to thank you all for taking this journey with Śrīla Prabhupāda and uh, we learn about what the Bhagavatam is um, by reciting the Śrīmad Bhagavata Mahima Stotram every day before we read um, compiled by Śrīla Sanatana Goswami senior disciple of Śrī Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself who spent two months solid taking full instruction from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all the aspects of uh, the science of devotional service. It goes like this. Sarva Shastra Dipi Yusha Sarva Vedaika Satpala Sarva Siddhanta Ratnaja Sarva Logaika Drik Prada O nectar from the ocean of all scriptures, singular fruit of all the Vedas, rich mine of the precious gems of all conclusive truths, you are the only giver of sight to all the worlds. Sarva Bhagavata Prana, Srimad Bhagavata Prabhu, Kali Dvanduditaditya, Sri Krishna Parivartita. O life heir of all the Supreme Lord's devotees, O Master, Srimad Bhagavatam, you are the sun risen in the darkness of Kali. You are the exact image of Sri Krishna. Paramananda Pataya Prema Varshakshadayate Sarvada Sarvasevyaya Shri Krishnaya Namostume 
I bow down to you, who are supremely blissful to read. Your every syllable pours down a flood of prema. You can always be served by everyone. You are Sri Krishna Himself. Madeka bando matsangin madguro man mahadana manestadaka mad bhagya mad ananda namostute. My only friend, my only com my constant companion, my spiritual master, my great wealth, <clears throat> my savior, my good fortune, my source of ecstasy, I bow down to you. Sadhu, sadhu ta dayin, atini chuchata kara, hanamun chikadachen mam, premna rit kanta yokspura. O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O exalter of the most fallen, please never leave me. Always appear in my heart and my voice with pure love. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So, Srimad Bhagavatam, the Bhagavat Purana, we reached Canto 4, the creation of the fourth order. Chapter 1, text 1. <clears throat> Sri Maitreya said, Swayam Bhuvamanu begot three daughters in his wife Shatarupa, and their names were Akuti, Devahuti, and Prasuti. Purport First, let us offer our respectful obeisances unto our spiritual master, Om Vishnupad. Sri Srimad Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Prabhupada, by whose order I am engaged in this Herculean task of writing commentary on the Srimad Bhagavatam as the Bhakti Vedanta purports. By his grace, we have finished three cantos already, and we are just trying to begin the fourth canto. By his divine grace, let us offer our respectful obeisances unto Lord Chaitanya, who began this Krishna consciousness movement of Bhagavad Dharma 500 years ago. And through His grace, let us offer our obeisances to the six Goswamis, and, let, and then let us offer our obeisances to Radha and Krishna, the spiritual couple who enjoy eternally in Vrindavan with their cowherd boys and damsels in Brajabhumi. Let us also offer our respectful obeisances to all the devotees and eternal servitors of the Supreme Lord. In this fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, there are 31 chapters, and all these chapters describe the secondary creation by Brahma and the Manus. The Supreme Lord Himself does the real creation by agitating His material energy and then by His order, Brahma, the first living creature in the universe, <clears throat> attempts, excuse me, I'm just highlighting a word, Brahma needs a diacritic. The Supreme Lord Himself does the real creation by agitating His material energy and then by His order Brahma, the first living creature in the universe attempts to create the different planetary systems and their inhabitants expanding the population through His progeny 
like Manu and other progenitors of living entities who work perpetually under the order of the Supreme Lord. In the first chapter of this fourth canto, there are descriptions of the three daughters of Swayambhuva Manu and their descendants. The next six chapters describe the sacrifice performed by King Daksha and how it was spoiled. Thereafter, the activities of Maharaj Dhruva are described in five chapters. Then, in eleven chapters, the activities of King Prithu are described, and the next eight chapters are devoted to the activities of the Pracheta kings. As described in the first verse of this chapter, Swayambhuva Manu had three daughters, namely Akuti, Devahuti, and Prasuti. Of these three daughters, one daughter, Devahuti, has already been described, along with her husband, Kardama Muni, and her son, Kapila Muni. In this chapter, the descendants of the first daughter, Akuti, will specifically be described. Swayambhuva Manu was the son of Brahma. Brahma had many other sons, but Manu's name is specifically mentioned first because he was a great devotee of the Lord. In this verse, there is also the word cha, indicating that besides the three daughters mentioned, Swayambhuva Manu also had two sons. Text 2 Akuti had two brothers, but in spite of her brothers, King Swayambhuva Manu handed her over to Prajapati Ruchi on the condition that the son born of her be returned to Manu as his son. This he did in consultation with his wife, Shatarupa. Purport Sometimes a sonless person offers his daughter to a husband on the condition that the, his grandson will re, be returned to him to be adopted as his, his son and in, inherit his property. This is called putrika dharma, which means that by, the ex, by execution of religious rituals, one gets a son, although one is sonless by one's own wife. But here we see extraordinary behavior in Manu. For in spite of his having two sons, he handed over his first daughter to Prajapati Ruchi on the condition that the son born of his daughter be returned to him as his son. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur comments in this connection that King Manu knew that the Supreme Personality of Godhead would take birth from the womb of Akuti. Therefore, in spite of having two sons, he wanted the particular son born of Akuti because he was ambitious to have the Supreme Personality of Godhead appear as his son and grandson. Manu was the lawgiver of mankind and since he personally executed the Putrika Dharma, we may accept that such a system may be adopted by mankind also. Thus, even though one has a son, if he wants to have a particular son from one's daughter, he may give one's daughter in charity on that condition. That is the opinion of Srila Jiva Goswami. Text 3 Ruchi, who is very powerful in his Brahminical qualifications and was appointed one of the progenitor, progenitors of the living entities begot one son and one daughter by his wife, Akuti. Purport The word Brahma Barchasvi is very significant. Could you pass me my watch? Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. The word Brahma Varcha Svi is very significant. <clears throat> Ruchi was a Brahmana and he executed Brahminical duties very, very rigidly. 
as stated in Bhagavad Gita, the Brahminical qualifications are control of the senses, control of the mind, cleanliness within and without, development of spiritual and material knowledge, simplicity, truthfulness, faith in the Supreme Personality of Godhead, etc. There are many qualities which indicate a Brahminical personality and it is understood that Ruchi followed all the Brahminical principles rigidly. Therefore he is specifically mentioned as Brahma Varchasvi, one who was born of a Brahmana family but does not act as a Brahmana is called in Vedic language a Brahma Bandhu and is calculated to be on the level of Shudras and women. Thus, in the Bhagavatam, we find that Mahabharat was specifically compiled by Vyasadeva for Sri Shudra Brahma Bandhu. Sri means women, Shudra means the lower class of civilized human society, and Brahma Bandhu means persons who are born in the families of Brahmanas but do not follow the rules and regulations carefully. All these three, all of these three classes are called less intelligent and they have no access to the study of the Vedas, which are specifically meant for persons who have acquired the Brahminical qualifications. This restriction is based not upon any sectarian distinction, but upon qualification. The Vedic literatures cannot be understood unless one has developed the Brahminical qualifications. It is regrettable, therefore, that persons who have no Brahminical qualifications and have never been trained under a bona fide spiritual master nevertheless comment on Vedic literatures like the Srimad Bhagavatam and other Puranas. For such persons cannot deliver their real message. Ruchi was considered a first-class Brahmana. Therefore, it is mentioned here as Brahma Varchasvi, one who had full prowess in Brahminical strength. Text 4 Of the two children born of Akuti, the male child was directly an incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his name was Yagya which is another name of Lord Vishnu. The female child was a partial incarnation of Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, the eternal consort of Lord Vishnu. Purport Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, is the eternal consort of Lord Vishnu. Here it is stated that both the Lord and Lakshmi who were eternal consorts, appeared from Akuti simultaneously. Both the Lord and His consort are beyond this material creation, as confirmed by many authorities, Narayana Pudo Bhyaktat. Therefore, their eternal relationship cannot be changed, and Yagya, the boy born of Akuti, later married the goddess of fortune. Text 5 Swayambhuva Manu was gladly brought Swayambhuva Manu very gladly brought home the beautiful boy named Yagya and Ruchi, his son-in-law kept with him the daughter Dakshina Purport Swayambhuva Manu was very glad to see that his daughter Akuti had given birth to, boy, a, to both a boy and girl. He was afraid that he would take, that he would take one son. And he was afraid that he would take one son, and that because of this, his son, son-in-law Ruchi might be sorry. Thus, when he heard that a daughter was born along with the boy, he was very glad. Ruchi, according to his promise, returned his male child to Swayambhuvamanu and decided to keep the daughter whose name was Dakshina. One of Lord Vishnu's names is Yagya because he is the master 
of the Vedas. The name Yajna comes from Yajusham Pati, which means Lord of all sacrifices. In the Yajur Veda, there are different ritualistic prescriptions for performing yajyas, and the beneficiary of all such yajyas is, is the Supreme Lord, Vishnu. Therefore, it is stated in Bhagavad Gita 3 9, Yajyartat Karmana. One should act, but one should perform one's prescribed duties only for the sake of yajya or Vishnu. If one does not act for the satisfaction of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, or if one does not perform devotional service, then there will be reactions to all one's activities. It does not matter if the reaction is good or bad. If our activities are not dovetailed with the desire of the Supreme Lord, or if we do not act in Krishna consciousness, then we will be responsible for the results of all our activities. There is always a reaction to every kind of action. But if actions are performed for yajna, there is no reaction. Thus, if one acts for yajna, or the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one is not entangled in the material condition. For it is mentioned in the Vedas and also in Bhagavad Gita, that the Vedas and the Vedic rituals are all meant for understanding the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. From the very beginning, one should try to act in Krishna consciousness. That will free one from the reactions of material activities. Text 6 The Lord of the ritualistic performance of Yajna later married Dakshina, who was anxious to have this personality of Godhead as her husband. And in this wife, the Lord was also very much pleased to beget twelve children. Purport An ideal husband and wife are generally called Lakshmi Narayana to compare themselves, to compare them to the Lord and the Goddess of Fortune. For it is significant that Lakshmi and Narayana are forever happy as husband and wife. A wife should always remain satisfied with her husband, and a husband should always remain satisfied with his wife. In the Chanika Shloka, the moral instructions of Chanika Pandit, it is said that if a husband and wife are always satisfied with one another, then the goddess of fortune automatically comes. In other words, where there is no disagreement between husband and wife, all material opulence is present, and any good children and good children are born. Generally, according to Vedic civilization, the wife is trained to be satisfied in all conditions, and the wife and the husband, according to Vedic instruction, is required to please the wife with sufficient food, ornaments, in clothing. Then, if they are satisfied with their mutual dealings, good children are born. In this way, the entire world can become peaceful. But unfortunately, in this age of Kali, there are no ideal husbands and wives. Therefore, unwanted children are produced and there is no peace and prosperity in the present day world. Text 7 The twelve boys born of Yajna in Dakshina were named Tosha, Pratosha, Santosha, Bhadra, Shanti, Idaspati, Idma, Kavi, Vibhu, Swana, Swana, Sudeva, and Rochana. Text 8 during the time of Swayam Bhuvamanu, these sons all became the de demigods, collectively named the Tushitas. Marichi became the head of the seven Rishis, and Yajna became the king of the demigods, Indra. Purport During the life 
of Swayam Bhuvamanu, six kinds of living entities were generated from the demigods known as the Tushitas, from the sages headed by Marichi and from descendants of Yagya, king of the demigods. And all of them expanded their progeny to observe the order of the Lord to fill the universe with living entities. These six kinds of living entities are known as Manus, Devas, Manuputras, Angshavatars, Sureshwars, and Rishis. Yagya, being the incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, became the leader of the demigods, Indra. Text 9 Swayambhuvamanu's two sons, Priyavrata and Uttanapad, became very powerful kings, and their sons and grandsons spread all over the three worlds during that period. Text 10 My dear son, Swayambhuvamanu handed over his very dear daughter, Devahuti to Kardama Muni. I have already spoken to you about them and you have heard about them almost in full. Text 11 Swayam Bhuvamanu handed over his daughter Prasuti to the son of Brahma named Daksha who was also one of the progenitors of the living entities. The descendants of Daksha are spread throughout the three worlds. Text 12 You have already been informed about the nine daughters of Kardama Muni who were handed over to nine different sages. I shall now describe the descendants of those nine daughters. Please hear from me. Purport The third canto has already described how Kardama Muni begot nine daughters in Devahuti and how all the daughters were later handed over to great sages like Marichi, Atri and Vasishta. Text 13 Kardava Muni's daughter Kala who was married to Marichi gave birth to two children whose names were Kashapa and Purnima. Their descendants are spread all over the world. Text 14 My dear Vidura, of the two sons, Kashapa and Purnima, Purnima begot three children named Viraja, Vish Vishwaga, and Devakulya. Of these three, Devakulya was the water which washed the lotus feet of the Personality of Godhead and which later on transformed into the Ganges of the heavenly planets. PURPORT Of the two sons, Kashapa and Purnima, herein Purnima's descendants are described. An elaborate description of these descendants will be given in the sixth canto. It is also understood herein that Devakulya is the presiding deity of the river Ganges which comes down from the heavenly planets to this planet and is accepted to be sanctified because it touched the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari. Text 15 Anusuya the wife of Atrimuni gave birth to three very famous sons, Soma, Dattatreya, and Durvasa, who were partial representations of Lord Vishnu, Lord Shiva, and Lord Brahma. Soma was a partial representation of Lord Brahma, Dattatreya was a partial representation of Lord Vishnu, and Durvasa was a partial representation of Lord Shiva. Purport In this verse we find the words Atma Isha Brahma Sambhavan 
Atma means the super soul or Vishnu. Isha means Lord Shiva and Brahma means the four-headed Lord Brahma. The three sons born of Anasuya, Dattatreya, Durvasa and Soma were born as partial representations of these three demigods. Atma is not in the category of the demigods or living entities because he is Vishnu. Therefore he is described as Viminangsha Bhutanam. The super soul, Vishnu, is the seed giving father of all all living entities, including Brahma and Lord Shiva. Another meaning of the word another meaning of the word Atma may be accepted in this way. The principle who is the super soul in every Atma, or one may say, the soul of everyone, became manifested as Dattatreya, because the word Anksha, part and parcel, is used here. In Bhagavad Gita, the individual souls are also described as parts of the Supreme Personality of Godhead or Super Soul. So why not accept that Dadatreya was one of those parts. Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma are also described here as parts. So why not accept all of them as ordinary individual souls? The answer is that the manifestations of Vishnu and those of the ordinary living entities are certainly all parts and parcels of the Supreme Lord and no one is equal to Him. But among the parts and parcels, there are different categories. In the Varaha Purana, it is nicely explained that some of the parts are Swanksha and some are Vibhinangsha. Vibhinangsha parts are called Jivas and Swanksha parts are in the Vishnu category. In the Jiva category, the Vibhinangsha parts and parcels, there are also gradations. That is explained in the Vishnu Purana where it is clearly stated that the individual parts and parcels of the Supreme Lord are subject to being covered by the external energy called illusion or maya. Such individual parts and parcels who can travel to any part of the Lord's creation are called sarvagata and the suffering and are suffering the pangs of material existence. They are proportionately freed from the coverings of ignorance under material existence according to the different levels of work and under different influences of the modes of material nature. For example, the sufferings of jivas situated in the mode of goodness are less than those of jivas situated in the mode of ignorance. Pure Krishna consciousness, however, is the birthright of every living of all living entities, because every living entity is part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. The consciousness of the Lord is also in the part and parcel, and according to the proportion to which that consciousness is cleared of material dirt, the living entities are differently situated. In the Vedanta Sutra, the living entities of different gradations are compared to candles or lamps with different candle power. For example, some electric bulbs have the power of 1,000 candles, some have the power of 500 candles, some have the power of 100 candles, some 50 candles, and so on. But all electric bulbs have light. Light is present in every bulb, but the gradations of light are different. Similarly, there are gradations of Brahman. The Vishnu Swanksha expansions of the Supreme Lord in different Vishnu forms are like lamps. Lord Shiva is also like a lamp, and the supreme candle power, or the 100% light, is Krishna. The Vishnu Tattva has 94%, the Shiva Tattva 
has 84%, Lord Brahma has 78%, and the living entities are also like Brahma. But in the conditioned state, their power is still more dim. There are gradations of Brahman, and no one can deny this fact. Therefore, the words Atmesha Brahma Sambhavan indicate that Tathatraya was directly part and parcel of Vishnu, whereas Durvasa and Soma were parts and parcels of Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma. Hare Krishna. So we're hearing about the way that the universal population became expanded by the first prajapatis, progenitors of mankind. This is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, 10th uh, chapter. Towards the beginning of the chapter, it is described there. Can I get the Gita? Text 6 of chapter 10 in Bhagavad Gita. Maharshaya Saptapurve <clears throat> Chatvaro Manavastata Madbhava Manasa Jata Yesham Loka Ima Prajaha. The seven great sages, and before them the four other great sages, and the Manus, progenitors of mankind, came from me born from my mind, and all the living beings populating the various planets descend from them. So this is an example of how the Srimad Bhagavatam expands the knowledge given in the Gita. The Gita has all knowledge. The Gita is not just for beginners, but the Bhagavatam uh, fluffs out, if you will, the knowledge of the Gita to expand our consciousness so that eventually we can accommodate the true understanding of, the, of Krishna, the full light, the full manifestation of the Absolute Truth. Hare Krishna. So this takes us to 8 o'clock. So we'll stop here, our daily readings, and we'll start text 16 tomorrow Hare Krishna now we'll just wait for the realizations and reflections or uh, discussions of different parts of the knowledge we've just heard And Radharaman is going to start us off. Hare Krishna, Radharaman. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Um, I've got a two-part question based on what you were saying at the beginning of the reading tonight um, to introduce the fourth canto. <coughs> um, if in the course of hearing the Bhagavatam from cover to cover, um, someone has missed out a couple of sections because they just missed a couple of sections especially like in a reading like this C can one catch them up and then s still get the, the benefit and then the second part is is that if one feels one's been you know inattentive whilst hearing should one hear it again to c but both questions culminating in, in order to get the proper result of hearing the Bhagavatam but full benefit mm. um, well the answer is yes and yes um, Srila Prabhupada's continual instruction throughout his Bhaktivedanta purports 
is that we should continually hear the Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam isn't just meant to be heard once. But if we follow this instruction and hear it all the way through, cover to cover, every verse and every purport, it's designed to expand our consciousness so that the next time we go through, and I'm, I don't know about you, but I've heard the Bhagavatam a few times, not a whole many times, but a few times all the way through, cover to cover. But every time I read them, I hear them, I, I, rem I learn more. And this is the nature of transcendental literature, in particular the Bhagavatam, because it is the, the ripened fruit of the Vedic knowledge, of the Shruti. Um, Nigama kalpa tador galitam palam. This is the very beginning. The first three verses are the uh, invocations for the Bhagavatam, the Mangalacharana, for the Bhagavatam. And there it says that the, the Bhagavatam is the ripened fruit of Nigama. And Nigama means Shruti, the original Vedas, not Smriti. Sometimes it's put in a category of Smriti because it is a Purana. But Jiva Goswami has re revealed to us that actually the Bhagavatam is eternal and it is the fruit of all the Vedic literatures, including the uh, original Shruti, the Vedas. So, if you miss some parts or fall asleep during some parts, you should just keep going and then when you come back to the next time, read it all the way through as much as possible. So you're not condemned if you don't hear it all the way through the first time, but you're encouraged to continue to hear it all the way through. And this is by the mercy of Prabhupada. He used to describe that his books are like a big pot of sugar. Wherever you reach in and take something, it's so it can be reached it can be read like that. Specific parts, especially after you've read it and you become a little familiar with the contents, then to go to a specific place and read about a specific incarnation or a specific subject matter. Uh, that, that will encourage you in your devotional service. And by all means, you should do that. You're encouraged to do that. But the more you hear from cover to cover the Bhagavatam, the more you become prepared to hear about Krishna properly. Hare Krishna. Hare Bo. <coughs> yes, Rati, Haribo, first out of the blocks again, Haribo. Jai Guru Maharaj, back in the flock, fourth canto, Ki Jai. Haribo. And Sudevi Dasi says, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Sudevi Dasi, Hare Krishna to you. And from Gopakanya Devi Dasi. Yes, Gopakanya Devi Dasi. Hare Krishna, dear Maharaj, and all assembled devotees. All glories to Sri the Prabhupada and Srimad Bhagavatam. Jai Srimad Bhagavatam, ki jai. Jai Ho Maharaj, thank you for your matchless service. Hare Krishna. And from Vilas Manjari. Yes, Vilas Manjari, I owe you a letter. You wrote me such a nice letter. But I have been so busy uh, editing Vaisheshika Prabhu's new book, and we're really Really relishing doing it together, uh, and I've been this week and last week very busy. So my letters in my inbox, and I will answer it for sure. Hari Krishna. Dear Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Our glories to Sri the Prabhupada. Thank you for taking us on this transcendental journey with Sri the Prabhupada. In text three, Sri the Prabhupada explains that three classes. Women, Shudra, Bhamabandhu, have no access to the study of the Vedas. This restriction is based not 
not on any sectarian distinction, but upon qualification. It seems in this statement that women cannot develop the Brahminical qualifications and cannot access Vedic scriptures. Could you please explain this a little further and how it applies? It means that generally speaking, um, those classes of persons are spiritually less intelligent and less qualified. But by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya and by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada, they can be raised to the Brahminical platform if they take initiation from a bona fide spiritual master and follow uh, the rules and regulations strictly. <coughs> then they're eligible to hear. Especially Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and Chaitanya Charitamrita. But generally speaking, they're not uh, allowed to hear the original Vedas, the original Shrutis, Rig, Yajur, Artarva, and, 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 Yad, and uh, Yajur, Vedas. Uh, because the language of these Vedas are not for human consumption, not just uh, those four classes. In the Kali Yuga, uh, Kalos Sambha, Shudra Sambhava, all personalities, whatever gender and whatever uh, race and whatever stature they have by birth, they're all considered to be born Shudras because the Garbhodana Sanskara are not being uh, performed and as we read today the unwanted children come from uh, such degra degraded sex life and therefore the, wor the world becomes um, overpopulated not over po overpopulated by uh, Shudra class who are not interested in those things but by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, He came to deliver all of us, whether we be women or men, shudras, we're all shudras, uh, Brahma Bandhus, anybody. Uh, if they're properly initiated and properly follow the principles, they can be elevated to the status of Vaishnava, which means they automatically have Brahminical qualities. This is rarely achieved, but even persons who are coming up from the beginning are accepted in the class of devotees, even if they're prakrita bhaktas or materialistic devotees, to associate with the devotees and the Bhagavatam, and they get the association of all the different acharyas, just like in the purports we read tonight, there were uh, references from Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur from Jiva Goswami and from others. Uh, therefore, there is no restriction. The Srimad Bhagavatam, by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, is for everyone. It was specifically introduced into this Kali Yuga in its form, in its eternal form, by Vyasadeva, under the instructions of Narada, and it is meant to be given to everyone. In that sense, it is better than the, Brahm, the Mahabharata, which was also compiled by Vyasadeva for all classes of human beings. And it contains the Gita. So the Bhagavatam leaves off where the, where the Gita left off, and it summarizes all the Puranas in a way that is understandable for the, Kali, for the souls of the Kali Yuga. So these verses were written before that. So in the Vedic, the strict Vedic culture, the, only the Brahmanas were allowed access to these teachings. But by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya uh, and the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, anyone who's duly initiated and who follows strictly, it's not a sentiment, and reads these books properly, even if they're not scholars, they just have to hear. If you hear continuously, you will understand. And I personally, I've heard your realizations and written, read your letters and how you think and how you have received this philosophy. 
And there's no question. There's no question. Therefore, in the Srimad Ch uh, Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, in a purport, Prabhupada says that all of the devotees, men and women, who are preaching the glories of these books uh, are, are equal. Spiritually, we're all equal. But we have different bodies uh, given to us by the modes of nature and therefore there are also differences. Just like we're all one, all the souls born in America are all Americans. But within that class there's so many varieties and and levels not everyone can claim to be the president so like that no one should but become disturbed just like in the Gita uh, Striya Vaishas Tata Shudras Tepi Yanti Padam Gatim so if we, if we concentrate on the third line Striya Vaishas Tata Shudras and we think we're not qualified and, and don't consider the last line Sriya uh, Vaishwasa uh, Param Gatim all of them can be brought to the perfectional stage so why should we what's the word emphasize one point at the, at the, and, and acknowledge the most important point I am a Kali Yuga soul, born a Shudra, no qualification whatsoever, no different than, you know, women or anybody else. But by the grace of Prabhupada, we are teaching and hearing and chanting and becoming Brahminically qualified. And it takes a lifetime. One has to be patient and continue to hear. And then we will be brought to the perfectional stage. And even if we're not completely purified, if we, we're sincere and we continue to follow these principles for the rest of our lives, Krishna will be there to help us. Prabhupada will be there to help us. Hare Krishna. This is also from Vilas Manjari. Hare Krishna Vilas Manjari. Maharaj, could you kindly explain what does presiding deity of the Ganges or of planets and so on mean? What does this look like? Is this presiding deity a personality as well as a river slash planet? Every form, every uh, feature uh, has a personified form in the spiritual world. And therefore, there are personified personalities who oversee these different planets and different aspects of the material creation. And sometimes they appear in their human forms and sometimes not. Just like we heard, who was it that became the daughter, see I can't even remember all. To, re to learn and, re and remember and be fully uh, aware of every single detail of the Bhagavatam that requires a Jiva Goswami <laughs> so don't think that we're going to remember everything but just we just keep on hearing and appreciating, hearing and appreciating and gradually at least the, the full picture is uh, put together in our consciousness and our consciousness is expanded, even if we can't remember all the details. But we did hear how one of the daughters of one of them, Prajapatis, became the presiding deity over the river. And specifically over that part of the river that goes to, through the heavenly planets. When our hearts are purified, then we will regain full faith and that full faith is actually ultimately love for Krishna. And there's a statement in the Gita purports in which Srila Prabhupada says, when our love of God is degraded into lust, it is very difficult to revive it to its original state. But even a late beginner by the power of Krishna consciousness can revive 
the love of God that's there in everyone's heart. Hare Krishna. And this is also from Vilas Manjari. Yes, Vilas Manjari. No need to reply to my letter, Maharaj. I'm happy you received it and I'm happy to be back in the live readings. Well, thanks for that. It's hard to keep up, but I will answer it anyway. <laughs> Maybe I won't answer every point, but I'll it's my it's my policy. <laughs> my vow. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Prabhupada answered all his letters and I try my best to answer all my letters. This is from Lloyd Prasad. Lloyd Prasad. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Nice name. Lloyd Prasad. Hare Krishna. To you. This is from Daitari Hari. Daitari Hari. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. We heard the point in text 5 today that we must act in Krishna consciousness or we will be responsible for the results of our activities and entangle ourselves in material reactions. Before becoming fixed in the practice of Krishna consciousness or the platform of Nishta, we may find ourselves to be quite unsteady in our ability to, properly, to be properly aware of Krishna while we do service. Worse still, we might become distracted from what we ought to be doing by giving attention to things that have nothing to do with Krishna consciousness. Does this mean that we are becoming entangled in material self-created reactions? Well, you can analyze things like that if you'd like, but it's more encouraging to um, know what the goal is and we know what the goal is from the Gita, uh, and then steadily move towards the goal. It's not that we can know everything or do everything immediately. No one can. So therefore we have to be utsahan, nishjayat, daryat, as Rupa Goswami uh, advises. We have to be enthusiastic, we have to be patient and we have to be determined. That means you continue your devotional life and all of these qualities will be manifested. Not exactly through the process of academic knowledge and analysis, but they will be uh, given to us through a kind of spiritual osmosis from the association of the personalities in these books and the personalities who teach these books, particularly Srila Prabhupada, who was so powerful a uh, preacher, maybe the most powerful preacher in the whole history of the universe. So yes, you get reactions for everything you do, but if you do something for the pleasure of Krishna only, there's no reaction to that activity. So if you become constantly doing what you do for Krishna's pleasure, if you can remember, according to the 57th verse of the 18th chapter in the Bhagavad Gita, if you can remember that whatever you do has been appointed or you have been uh, appointed to do that duty by Krishna before you begin, then you can overcome all obstacles. And you will remember Krishna from time to time while you're doing the activity and eventually, constantly. And that's the goal of Krishna consciousness. To be constantly thinking of Krishna somehow or other, Prabhupada used to say, somehow or other. Be always being doing something to always be doing something for Krishna. And keep yourself engaged. Uh, as Prabhupada said, no time for maya. That will come with time, with practice, with conviction, and with, with dridabhartaha, with determination. Because the soul is pure. The soul never becomes contaminated by these reactions. 
The bodies become contaminated. The subtle and the gross bodies become contaminated. But the original soul's consciousness does not become contaminated. Therefore, every single soul has the potential, especially in the human form, to inquire about the Absolute Truth and to become fixed in devotional service. Hare Krishna. Next is from Gora Nataraj Das. Yes, Gora Nataraj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Gratitude. Recently, someone in the streets mentioned how Vishnu is the Supreme. I remember once hearing Amarendra Prabhu refute from Shastra the superiority of Krishna over Vishnu. How can we establish Krishna's superiority, your servant Koranataraj Das? The point is that all the expansions of Krishna are Krishna. Does it think that one is superior to the other? This is a mistake. They're all the same person. But the only difference is that all of the qualities of all of the incarnations are contained within Krishna. And when, his expand, when he expands himself, only part of his full qualities are manifested. But the potential is there in every single uh, expansion of Krishna. So if you, in his Chaitanya Charitamrita, there's an analysis of this in the fifth chapter, I believe, of the Adi Lila, where it describes that if you, and also I think in the teachings of uh, Sanatana, Lord Chaitanya to Sanatana Goswami in the 20th or 21st or 22nd chapters, there it's described that you can call Vishnu, uh, Ma Vishnu Krishna, or Krishna Ma Vishnu. There's no harm in it. The ones who don't understand, they want to make one higher than the other. There's no harm in it, but they're all the same person. The reason they're the same person is because there are different souls who want to worship the Lord in a particular mood, in a particular way. And the Lord presents himself in all these forms to fulfill the desires of those devotees. So there's no harm in it, but the whole philosophy is given in the third chapter of the first canto, Ete Chang Shakalak Pungsa Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. Even though Krishna is included in the list of the major avatars, still at the end he said he says that Krishna is the source of all of them. So they're all Krishna but Krishna is the original source of all of them. And if someone can't understand that, don't be bewildered, don't be discouraged. Not that many people are capable of understanding that. Hare Krishna. From Goranga Gopal. Yes, Goranga Gopal, Hari Bo. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances, all glorious to Sri the Prabhupada. Starting this new canto is very exciting. I appreciated one part of the purport to verse 15. Quote, Pure Krishna consciousness, however, is the birthright of all living entities, because every living entity is part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. The consciousness of the Lord is also in the part and parcel, and according to the proportion to which that consciousness is cleared of material dirt, the living entities are differently situated. In the Vedanta Sutra, the living entities of different gradations are compared to candles or lamps with different candle power. Light is present in every bulb, but the gradations of light are different. Mm. Similarly, there are different gradations. Similarly, there are gradations of Brahman. Unquote. Once again, I am in awe with the clear and perfect analogies that Srila Prabhupada gives us in his books allowing us to understand such concepts to facilitate our own spiritual realizations. Very nice. Thank you very much, Gopal. That's a very clear uh, reflection. And it's good 
to take these gems out. What we do, we take these gems out and we look at them after we've already heard them again. And sometimes we hear the same gem come out from different reflections and we look at it from different angles. This is exactly what Prabhupada asked us to do. It's what I said in the very beginning little speech that I gave before we started the fourth canto. So let us continue to do this together and go back to the lotus feet of Krishna together. Hi Krishna. This is from Gopakanya Devi Dasi. Yes, Gopakanya Devi Dasi. She says, Thank you, Radharaman Prabhuji, for the question, and to dear Maharaj for the clearance. In that I am also missing the, the live readings, and sometimes I miss the connections. But I am always rehearing until it gets clear. Hare Krishna. That's the process. In the 34th uh, verse of the 4th uh, uh, chapter of the Gita, Tadbidi Panipatena, in the purport, Prabhupada says, we must get the clear understanding from the spiritual master. What that means is, you keep asking until you get it clear. You don't allow things to go in and then stay in that you don't understand. You keep clearing your doubts, clearing the understanding, misunderstandings, misgivings, until it becomes clear. And then you will see Krishna in the pages of the Bhagavatam. In all his resplendent features and, yes, messages. Hare Krishna. I'm from Subaru. Yes, Subaru. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances and all glories to Sri the Prabhupada. Thank you for your daily reading. While you were reading the descendants of Swayambhuvamanu, I was reflecting on the smriti, prowess of remembrance, of Sri the Veda Vyas, who compiled. So Sri the Veda Vyas, who could not only narrate the pastimes but also the names of the sons and daughters of the entire dynasty. Sri the Veda, Veda Vyas, Krishna Dvaipayana, is truly the incarnation of Lord Himself. Otherwise, how can He just narrate the Srimad Bhagavatam with so much details? While you were reading, my little teeny tiny brain lost track of the family tree of the Swayambhuvamanu. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj, for rendering the timeless wisdom to the eternal souls. Well, you know, even today there are since the advent of the internet they've made programs with logarithms and everything to trace one's you know forefathers and everyone's interested and here we are hearing the our ultimate forefathers we all came from Brahma we all came from one of the sons through other personalities this is our actual genealogical table that goes right back to to uh, the beginning. This is fascinating. We should be fascinated by this material. Even if we can't remember it all, it's not important. We should be fascinated and we should in relish hearing and gradually Krishna will become attracted to us because we're attracted to Him. We're interested in Him. The more we read the Bhagavatam, the more we prove to Krishna that we are interested in Him. And as soon as He sees that we're actually interested in Him again, then he will get out the broom in the heart and he will clean the, the house. You know, we're, he's our guest, you know, and he'll clean it himself because we just keep making the guest house dirtier and dirtier. This is the only way back to Godhead. Chanting the holy name of the Lord without offense and hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam without offense. Hare Krishna. This is from Nikki. Yes, Nikki. Hare Krishna Maharaj, all glories to Sri the Prabhupada. Thank you for another wonderful reading. Please could you explain what spiritual intelligence means and also what it takes to develop it? Thank you. Spiritual intelligence comes from the super soul to the soul. And ultimately it resides also in the soul, in the, the original the soul, the Atma. The Atma has its senses, the Atma has mind, the Atma has intelligence, just like we have here. But the 
form of the jiva uh, is made of different energy than the material energy. It's made of satchitananda, you know, eternity, knowledge, and blissfulness. The forms are actually made of those elements, spiritual elements. So the material intelligence is transformation of the mode of passion when the, in, the, in the beginning of the creation. And we each get a little part of it. And that material intelligence is variegated. Some people are more, some people are less. Some of them have different qualities of intelligence. But the spiritual intelligence comes from the soul, the super soul, to the soul. The form direction from the super soul to the soul gives spiritual intelligence. Sometimes psychologists call it conscience. This is where our conscience comes from. When we're about to do something that we know is wrong, we feel it, we know it, but we do it anyway if our hearts are dirty. The more our hearts come to goodness, then we will be able to control ourselves from doing something that is not right, that is wrong that will take us more into the material world. That is material intelligence. The form direction from the super soul gives us the intelligence how to come back to him. Tesham satati yuktanam bhajatam priti purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam yenamam upayanti te So if you want to get the intelligence from Krishna, uh, then you have to perform devotional service. Constantly. Tesham sadati yuktanam and priti purvakam with affection, with love. And then dadami buddhi yogam tam. Then he gives. Dadami means to give and buddhi means intelligence. And what kind? Dadami buddhi yogam tam yenamam upayantite. How to come back to me. That is spiritual intelligence. So the varieties of experience that come to us through the material intelligence is just that, it's material. Brings us back into the material world in a different form, in a different shape. Spiritual intelligence takes us back to the spiritual world. And that intelligence is given to us and can only be given to us by Krishna, by the super soul, through the super soul. Hare Krishna. This is from Surat Sarvagya. Surat Sarvat Sarvagya. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, thank you so much. Through your daily reading class, Bhagavatam, I could remember Krishna daily. I offer my humble obeisance to your lotus feet. Well, Hare Krishna, thank you very much. I'm just a peon delivering the mail, that's all. From Bhakta Rupa. Yes, Bhakta Rupa. Hari Hari Bo. Hari Hari Bo. Hari Krishna. And from Rati Manjari. Yes, Rati. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my respectful obeisances. All glories to the great preacher Srila Prabhupada. That's so sweet how Krishna takes on all these different forms to fulfill the desires of his devotees. It is almost inconceivable how far Krishna goes to want to fulfill the desires of the tiny jivas. Yes, and when we finally, once and for all, accept that inconceivable nature of Krishna, then we can understand. Until we actually accept that Krishna can do anything. And when we hear him do something wonderful, we will become ecstatic. Hare Krishna. That's pure Krishna consciousness. Well, it was a very auspicious beginning to the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. I thank all of you for your nice reflections and bringing out all these gems and looking them, at them from different angles of vision. Uh, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Samaveda Bhakti Vrinda ki jai. Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bo. See you tomorrow night. 
same time, same place, same topic, we're going to hear more about how the universe was populated and who our actual ancestors are, where we came from. Hare Krishna.